Greg, I'm an alcoholic. I'm your GSR. Okay, what happened at the last GSR meeting? Um, the Westside District approved $800 for a new sound system for their own use. And uh, they did so after much debate and uh, much scrutiny at looking at the budget. We have over $16,000 in the Westside District budget uh, surplus right now, so they figured we could afford it. Our sound system was kind of going out. Um, there's an H&I conference for anybody who's interested in H&I work. Uh, there's an H&I conference. This is when a lot of the people who work on panels in H&I get together and they, they um, sort of discuss what's going on in H&I and improvements that could be made. That's on April 28th through the 30th at the Covino, West Covina 502 Club. And I do have one flyer up here that if you're interested, you can come see. The Hispanic International AA Reunion, uh, Hispanic International AA Reunion, is going to be in November, November 24th through the 26th. There's also a flyer up front with more information about that if you're interested. And also there was the um, last, on March 3rd, there was the PRASA, which is Pacific Region Alcoholics Anonymous um, Service Assembly. This was held in Spokane, Washington, and I have the report that came back from that up front if you're interested in seeing what they discussed and what was re uh, resolved. And lastly, there's a GSR dance after the area assembly that's happening April 15th. The area assembly is happening at the Santa Monica uh, High School in the cafeteria where the whole area, the whole Southern California area representatives get together. If you're interested in how AA works in our area, that's something to, interesting to go to. And then uh, there will be a D uh, GSR dance uh, the 15th, April 15th, at the infamous Tacos Por Favor <laughs> at 14th and Olympic. And uh, there's information up here about that also. And you can ask me if you hunt me down at halftime. Thanks. Welcome. I'm back on track now. Okay, not to embarrass you, but so that we may get to know you, will the people in their first 30 days of sobriety stand and identify yourself? Okay, and when I point to you, can you give us your name and your disease? Hi, Chris. Hi, Monica. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Tony. Hi, Eric. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Brian. Hi, Richard. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> Hi, Brian. I'll go up here. Hi, Paul. No, you. Yep. <laughs> you. Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Karen. Hi, Rob. Hi, Andy. Hi, Randy. Anybody else? Hi, Ray. Hi, Vicki. Hi, get everybody. Welcome. <laughs> if there are any visitors from outside of the greater Los Angeles area, would you stand up? And as I point to you, give us your name, your hometown, and your home group. Hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. Hi. New York. Great. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hi, Brian. Hi. Hi, Richard. Hi, Jim. Hi. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi, Karen. Hi. Any? Oh, somebody's waving in the back. 
And I'm Lori, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm from Collegeville, Minnesota. <laughs> I used to live here. Are there any Al Anons here tonight? You are welcome here. Thanks. <clears throat> if there are any seats, empty seats next to you, can you raise your hand, please? Keep them up just for a minute here, and we'll see if. Raise them high. Okay. The heart of our program is defined in Chapter 5 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Tonight, I have asked Robert to read Chapter 5. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Robert. I'm an alcoholic. Chapter 5, how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who don't do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunate. They are not at fault. They t seem to have been born this way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner in which living demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There, there are those who too suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them, excuse me, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to, to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what we, what happened, and what we are like now. If you, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some, we bought. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all innocence in our work command. We beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us had tried to hold on to old ideas, but the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember, we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. <clears throat> Half measures of valid, that's nothing. We stood at a turning point. We asked his protection, care, and complete abandon. <clears throat> Here are the steps we took, which suggest as a program of recovery. <clears throat> Number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that, that our lives come, become unmanageable. Number two, come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, as we understood him. Number four, made a fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. Number five, <clears throat> admitted to God, to ourselves, and other human beings the exact nature of our wrongs. Number six, we are we're entirely, ready, entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. Number nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so or would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge, knowledge of his will for us to, and the power to carry that out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Number 12, having spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to those alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us have explained, what in order, I can't go through with it. <clears throat> Do not be discouraged. None of us... None of one, no one among us, excuse me, has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saying it's the point of this. We are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. <clears throat> Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter of the agnostic, our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we are alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were sought. Good job. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Let's have a hand for our first speaker, John. Yeah. 
Thank you. My name is John. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'd like to thank Barrow, first of all, for asking me to speak. Uh, I'd like to thank all the newcomers for standing and uh, acknowledging that you're here tonight to share with us. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to be here, grateful to be anywhere. I've been in, uh, my last drink was in December 1984, <clears throat> so I've been at this 15 years, and the program has saved my life. I'm a hardcore drinker. I discovered uh, a little bit of cocaine towards the end, but, you know, 98% of my story is about booze. I used to sit on a bar stool for endless hours, many days in a row, wondering what it took to find any glimmer of happiness. Um, I started drinking when I was 16 years old, and I got drunk the first time I drank, and very, very rarely did I not get drunk when I drank. And I didn't set out to do that. That's just what came naturally. Uh, my sense of it is that I am, I'm just wired wrong, you know, that's how I feel about it. And in order for me to live and be happy today, I cannot alter my consciousness with drugs or alcohol. But it took me many years to come to that understanding because the, my disease is so powerful. For the longest time, it was a step ahead of my best efforts. And uh, th looking back on it, the thing that my disease was best at was amplifying the, my negative feelings in the moment and causing me to act on them. If I felt like communicating with you, if I needed you or wanted something from you, especially if you were a, a young woman and you were not interested in what I had to say or offer, I took that rejection and, you know, took it out on the next 20 people I came across, <clears throat> either in the car or on the phone or in my writing, which is what I do, and uh, it was awful. And it's a miracle to me that more people just didn't stop and say, hey, you know, I don't deserve this people that I came across in my life were incredibly uh, flexible about putting up with what I did to them. And I don't know how my life would have gone had someone stopped me. You know, my parents were both alcoholics, and nothing was going to be stopped by them. And, uh, you know, I come from a family of alcoholics, I'm uh, of Scandinavian descent, and after I graduated from high school, I went over there, and um, that gave a real boost to my drinking, because everybody drank in the morning before they went out on the fishing boats. And uh, there was a little ritual they did with the Akavit, with this kind of thing, and, uh, you know, this is like 5 o'clock in the morning before you go out on the North Sea. And uh, I went out on a couple of those trips and got sick of it real quick, and came back to uh, Connecticut, you know. <laughs> so, but, but there was some romance to it, there was hardiness to it, there was camaraderie to it, uh, there were uh, young girls who saw, who did not have the Judeo-Christian barriers that most American girls have. <laughs> And uh, so it's a miracle I returned from there at all. Um, but uh, I'm still kind of sad even today about my 20s. You know, my 20s are just a blur and a mess. Uh, I shared here a couple of years ago about, you know, you get these intermittent flashbacks as, as you get sober. You remember things that happened in blackouts and these little patches of memory. And I remember waking up once and having my, <clears throat> my you know, the, uh, the car I was driving and the door handles uh, scrape on a, on, a, on a, I was going 60 miles an hour, as was the other car. And 
this is back when you know cars were not designed by computers and the door handles actually stuck out. You know, um, and I had you know I had any any number of any number of incidents like that. You know, where my my I sh I could have been dead a tenth of a second here, a tenth of a second there, um, and many of us, as we know, are killed in cars and, and in other accidents because of the disease. Um, I was married at the time. I, 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 I uh, went into rehab in December of 84, and uh, my wife at the time was extraordinarily gifted when it comes to uh, understanding the disease in someone else. She, she was not, uh, she's an ACOA, self-described. Self and uh, my years worth, my early years of sobriety with her were wonderful, but getting the steps was very difficult for me. I worked, I was so enraged at, at my father for the first five years that I white knuckled, basically. I worked the first three steps with my first sponsor and then white knuckled it for five years until I had pretty much what amounts to a nervous breakdown at his gravesite. And uh, this tremendous rush of forgiveness about his violence towards, towards me and my family uh, just it just seemed to come out of nowhere. I guess I'd hit bottom about that issue. And my life has been good ever since that moment. I have to say my first five years were so hard because all the people who kept saying, you know, work steps four through 12, I just flat didn't believe them, you know. It was that simple. Uh, the first step I got right away, and I, I work it every morning, and I'm very grateful that I've never had the urge to actually pick up, you know, I've, I've acted out, uh, when I get stressed, I do things that I shouldn't do, but generally I confine the harm to myself. Uh, but even that has taken some years to, you know, develop, you know, the, the road, as they say, gets narrower. And the way things stand now, almost all of the damage I do is done to myself, you know, uh, the circle of pain just, you know, get smaller, I suppose, if you're doing this right. Um, but once I started working the steps about 10 years ago, I couldn't do a four-step handwritten. Uh, that was beneath me. I'm a writer, so, you know, you crack open the laptop and you do it like that. And, uh, you know, the, the, it took me like three, four steps before I could actually pick up a pencil and just, it was so agonizing to write it out that way for me. But, of course, that was the most beneficial one. Um, and as a result, a after that last fourth step, I can tell the truth to myself in those private moments when my sponsor isn't around, when my close AA friends aren't around. I can sit still and tell the truth to myself and act accordingly most of the time today. And it's only because of this program that I can do that. Uh, in the last year, um, I have faced uh, two mortal illnesses, both in the same month, or one uh, dealt with through surgery and the other one a complication of surgery. And. Um, I learned in, the, in, that experience, in those experiences back in October to be present like I've never been present for anything. Uh, all, every little bit of knowledge that I have learned in these rooms over the years I had to bring to bear to get through this, these experiences sober. And uh, God held my hand the whole time. There was one moment. 25 minutes before the surgery when I thought I saw God's dark side, that's how I refer to it, when I thought he was just playing a joke on me. And I knew abject terror in that moment. And it passed in about 30 seconds. And in some strange way, my I have not had a war in my head about the usual things that go on in my life since that moment. A lot of seemingly conflicting pieces of information can coexist in my head now without the war going on, you know. Um, 
when I get angry, it's like World War I in the winter. You know, it's like I am entrenched over here. The disease is entrenched a mile over there. There's no man's land in the middle, and none of us is going to give a damn inch, you know, for years at a time. That's how it feels. You know. But, you know, at, at some point, you've got to, like, it's step one. You put down your gun, and you go in the other direction quietly and hope that the disease doesn't see you surrender. You know. So, you know, I'm still in the process of learning that. Uh, you know, my life today is good. The problems I have are mundane. Um, you know, the medical stuff is mostly behind me. Uh, I have a woman in my life now who's going to move out here from New York. I'm a New Yorker, and she's going to move out here in the, in the summer. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And... Uh, you know, all I really have to uh, have to offer, you know, on top of that, are ju would just be details. You know, those kind of barometric details to let you know that that uh, it's all worthwhile. That I have had those incredibly dark, depressing moments, and although I've never wanted to pick up, I have wanted to disappear. Uh, I've felt that the that the space I have occupied would be more valuable if I were just not in it, not anywhere. I mean, just depression, suicidal depression, but not with the active component of doing anything about it, just wishing I didn't exist. And that's the disease at its best. Some days the disease beats me up pretty bad. And uh, I've been sharing with friends lately that in, the pr in my process of meditating, which is very important to me, I've, I've, I used to be a morning meditator, but I meditate mostly at night now. Um, I haven't been able to, to clear that so-called channel to, uh, to uh, communicate with my higher power. I, I think of my higher power as a kind of benevolent gangster. You know. <laughs> Some of you who, who know New York or New York lore know who uh, Vincent the Chin Gigante is. He staggers, he used to, he's in jail now, finally, but he used to stagger around Greenwich Village in his bathrobe, you know, feigning insanity. And my higher power, I think of him as a, as a kind of benevolent version of that guy where if I'm getting ready to do something that's going to harm myself or others, I hear the voice, John, I need to talk to you for a minute. <laughs> You know, and we go for a little walk, you know, <laughs> down the sidewalk, and he lets me know what the ramifications are if I act out. <laughs> so, anyway, there are a lot of birthdays tonight, and I say happy birthday to all of them, so I'm going to cut it right there. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, John. Our group is self-supporting through our own contributions. We will now observe the seventh tradition. Please remain seated. This is not a break. While the baskets are being passed, we have a few announcements from our co-secretary, Bill. Hi, I'm Bill, your alcoholic co-secretary try and make this quick. I'll use the short version tonight. Um, we provide child care free of charge. Uh, if you'd like to donate for the babysitter, there's a can right down here for that. Um, it's, a, uh, it's customary at this meeting to donate one dollar for each year of sobriety. Um, there's a can right here for that. Um, if you, we, there's a lot of birthdays tonight, so if you could please limit your sharing to one minute. Um, I'd appreciate it. There's tapes available here uh, at the end of the meeting by Christopher can get you a tape. This meeting is being taped, just to let everybody know. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous does not own this facility, so um, there's no smoking anywhere on the grounds. Um, 
If you want to smoke, you can go out this way, smoke out by the curb where everybody else runs at the end of the, at the break. Um, please don't smoke on the grounds. It's really important. Um, what else is there? Uh, we set this meeting up at 6.30, so if you'd like to uh, help... Oh, 6 o'clock, sorry. Um, we start seat saving at 6.30. You can save a seat for one person and yourself. Um, the lot back here by the kitchen is for people with commitments. If you park back there, please move it, or if you want a commitment, see me. Um, we recycle on the back, and there's water and soda for sale back there at the break. Um, at, the, at the end of the break, you'll hear a bell. Um, if you could please return to your seat as quickly as possible so you can hear the 12 traditions and give the main speaker enough time to share. Thanks for letting me be of service. I think it's birthday time. I don't know where that is. Right here. Okay, will all the birthday people and the cake givers please come up to the stage now? Also, okay. Robbie. Oh, th right here? Can you add Robbie on there? Sure. Thanks. Do I am? Um... Gaza's here? And Gaza, G E Z A. Thanks, sorry. Okay. Hey. For how many years? Oh. Three. Okay. And then Gene. Gene. You're there, Gene. Okay, you're already there. Okay. And, and Bonnie. B O N. And We celebrate birthdays with a candle for each 365 days of continuous sobriety. Tonight we have 12 birthdays. We will now sing happy birthday to them all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear A. Happy birthday to you. Keep coming. Okay, so we have our donation can here. And <clears throat> please limit your comments to one minute. Is there still the famous bell? Yeah? Thank you. Okay. So our first birthday tonight is Leon for three years, given by Marty, Loli, Ivan, Brad, Jean, Chris, Robbie, Geza, and Bonnie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leon, and I'm an addict alcoholic. Hi, and, um, wow, three years, and I couldn't have done it without my sponsor, Marty, and without people like Ivan. And, um, and Geza is the first person I ever, like, made a major, like, like, fuck up in sobriety, and I had to make a 
10 step right away to it and he was like so super cool and understanding and like he just said yeah i've done the same thing a million times so like thank you for helping me learn those lessons guys and uh thanks to my higher power and uh thank you for letting me be here thanks <laughs> Okay, thank you. Our next birthday is for Lori for 10 years. <laughs> given by Eva, Joanna, Sue, Elizabeth, Michelle, Maggie, and her mom. Hi, I just want to thank everyone that gave me a cake. I'm Lori, I'm an addict alcoholic. And, you know, that was my sponsor, my first sponsor. And there's um, two of my first sponsees, Joanna and Eva, and some of my beautiful friends from New York, and my mom and my sister, and my dad's there, and a good friend, Jill's in the audience. And, you know, they came here because I'm getting married tomorrow. And, um,. <laughs> I feel pretty blessed. I got sober here in Malibu. Um, it works. It works if you work it. You know, I was sitting in the rooms with my arms folded thinking it would never happen to me. And, um, you know, being able to stay sober. Um, my whole life I feel is a miracle. And I'm, it's just full of gifts. And it's, and it's because of my friends and these beautiful people on the stage and out here. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Isn't she beautiful? She's going to make a beautiful bride. <laughs> um, our next cake is for Laura for 12 years, and it's given by Lin Linda Joe. Linda Joe. Linda Joe. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank Linda Joe. We've been friends for the last seven years. And uh, I have no doubt that this is God's sense of humor putting us together. But um, she's a wonderful friend. She's one of those people that I call first when anything happens. And uh, I love you a lot. And uh, I just, all I can tell you is I came here and my whole life was in shambles. I was 42 years old and I had nothing left. And uh, 12 years later, I have a great life, you know, and it's absolutely because I work the steps on a daily basis. I call my sponsor every day still, and um, I, I just can't tell you what Alcoholics Anonymous can do for you if you just work the program. It's really, it really is simple, and um, I just love being here. Thanks for sharing my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Our fourth birthday is for Steve for 13 years. Given by John. Johan. I can't read this writing. Um, Craig and Jeff. Steve, alcoholic, <clears throat> severe cotton mouth. Um, I'm really grateful for, uh, you know, tonight's gratitude for me tonight. <clears throat> I want to thank my friends up here on the podium. Uh, <clears throat> I have friends in the audience, my family in the audience. Um, you know, when I was a kid <clears throat> using and drinking, I had another really good friend that uh, we used to joke about not living to be 30. <clears throat> he died at 29 of this disease. Um, I turned 40 today, and, uh, and <laughs> turning 40 is a miracle. Um, turning 13 is unbelievable. Um, you know, I'm grateful for this program. I'm grateful for, you know, I, I, I saw today, I mean, you know, I had some friends over, 
And I'm so graced with the beauty of friendship and, uh, and the love of everybody here. So thank you. Thank you. Our next birthday is for Roland for 13 years, given by Dan and Hollis. I'm rolling. I'm an alcoholic. I feel like I'm on a stage up here. Um, just seeing if you're paying attention. Um, hey, you know, uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, uh, it's been a great, uh, great trip for me. And uh, I'd just like to thank AA, the members, and, uh, and God especially. And you know, my home group is the Peninsula Group uh, noon meeting on Saturdays in, uh, in Oxnard. It's not just another pretty name. And, uh, and you know, I came in here along uh, quite a few number of years ago, and uh, I stayed sober for about a year and then went in and out for a couple more. Um, then I met a newcomer, and I got married. And, uh, <laughs> and then I took the steps, <laughs> and uh, things got better. But anyways... Thank you very much. Uh, I, and anybody that's new, I really uh, take the steps to give you a life you can't imagine. Thanks. Okay. Our next birthday is me, Lori, <laughs> for 15 years. And Lori and Mindy will give me the cake. Hi, I'm Lori again. I'm an alcoholic. You'll all know my name by the end of this. Um, well, wow, what a journey. Um, when I got sober, I was working for Seagram's, the liquor company. <laughs> and now I'm studying to get my master's in theology. So I'm studying about faith. And, you know, AA, um, it's just... It, a few years ago, I took a cake and I said, you know, I feel like I don't deserve this. And somebody said, you deserve everything you have. And I'm studying, and the definition of grace is free gift, unmerited. And, you know, my life is graced because of God, because of this program, because of um, I have a little son. Um, I was able to be present when my dad died. Um, four months later, I was able to be there when my niece was born and took her first breath. And, um, you know, I'm here at my friend's wedding. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful life. And it's not easy, but it's worth it. So hang in there. God bless. <laughs> and I don't have to go anywhere. Okay. Our next birthday. <laughs> okay. Rich is our next birthday, 16 years. Cindy and Melanie? Okay. <laughs> My name is Rich. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I'd like to thank uh, God and Alcoholics Anonymous for my sobriety. And uh, I'd like to thank my uh, lovely wife, Cindy, for that cake. And my daughter, Melissa. Uh, my wife is really great mother and uh, we have a really good life today um, our daughter is such a blessing <laughs> she really is we call her mini me <laughs> you know I like to welcome the newcomers and uh, congratulations to the other people taking cakes there's uh, a lot of sobriety here tonight and, you know if you're new uh, this thing works you know, it really works for the long haul. And that's good because it's a killer disease. And uh, if you're new, keep coming back. And like the guy said, get in a relationship. Thanks. <laughs> okay, our next birthday is for Jim L. for 20 years by his family and Marilyn and Richard. Oh. 
That's just practice. No, the 18th first. Okay. Lori, we have an 18th. Right oh, here. I'm sorry. Okay. Whoops. <laughs> Cindy for 18 years, given by Rich and Melanie. My name's Cindy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Cindy. And I'd like to thank Rich and Melanie Rose for that cake tonight. And it's been a real miracle uh, being sober this long, and uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I finally got it right with uh, my spouse, and we have a beautiful baby. And uh, I'm just happy to be alive today, and I love all of you, and I hope you all stay sober. Keep coming back. Okay, Jim L., 20 years, family, Marilyn and Richard. Hi, I'm Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jim. 20 years. That's a long time. Uh, I want to want to thank my family. Uh, I'd like to name them all off by name, but I can't remember them all. <laughs> There's four people missing: my mom, my son, my sister, and one of my brothers. Uh, this is Mary and her little baby Alexandra. They were here last year to give me a cake, supporting me, and. Uh, this is my daughter, Jamie, right here in the black. That's my sister, Kathy. She's got 14 years. This is her husband-to-be, Tony. He's got more years than me. This is Mikey, my nephew, their kid. That's my girlfriend, Marilyn, back there in the red. She's supporting me. And <laughs> so, my brother, Dino, back here, big guy. He's got 13 years. There's a bunch of us in the program. I got uh, somebody else. Did I miss somebody? Oh, there's Richard. Back here, he's hiding. <laughs> Anyway, uh, they're all, I sponsor Richard, and it's a pleasure. Uh, sobriety is a wonderful thing, and uh, I want to thank you all for my life. Okay, our next birthday is for Jordan. For 21 years, Chris and Ramon will give him the cake. Hello, my name's Gordon and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I also like to thank Bill and Rio for uh, giving me the cake and uh, someone would have told me 21 years ago that I'd be sober this many years, I would have thought that they had uh, completely lost their mind or I was hearing things that weren't being said, but uh, it's a great program and as far as being a service, all of you, if you aren't drinking into your meetings, you're doing me a great service, and thank you. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. It's expensive to get sober here. <laughs> okay, oh boy. Our next birthday is from Marty W. for 31 years. Jim will give him the cake. I'm Audie Warner. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to... Uh, I'm tone deaf. Uh, <clears throat> I want to, uh, you know, my true feelings are, I can say it in two words, uh, you know, I'm overwhelmed and I feel terribly overpaid as well. 
if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, and there's a lot of new people here, some of you may have been in and out, uh, so you know what I'm about to say is true. Uh, you know, I'm so grateful for the fact that I could have missed this program. I almost did. My arrogance, my attitude almost took me out the door again. And it wasn't necessary, thanks to a loving God and a wonderful bunch of people that I knew. So if you're new, uh, don't miss this thing, man. Uh, it's just incredible. I have a great life. Uh, if you'd have told me when I got here that I was going to stay here 31 years, I'd have laughed at you. you know, um, <clears throat> thank God I only have to do it a day at a time. Two, two things I want to say to newcomers also is that uh, there's two things missing from the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and it's important you know that. One of them is nowhere in the book does it say you have to like it. <laughs> Tells you a lot of times you have to do it, but it doesn't say you have to like it. And the other thing is there's no timetable. It doesn't tell you how many months you have to have to do which step. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Thanks, my friend Jim. Okay, our last birthday is for Charles, 45 years. Yeah. William, we'll give him the cake. Fire. Hi, my name is Charles, and I'm alcoholic. Hi, Charles. Um, you know, last year I didn't have the... $44, <laughs> and I do now. Things get better. <laughs> and um, I'm so grateful for this way of life. There's, um, there's, there's this, I mean, this alcoholism that I had from as a little person and dominated me and then was this threshold into this continuing way of life that I you know, stumble along. I don't do anything at all, really, to deserve this, to be part of this very impressive movement. And then all your wonderful stories of courage and support and everything that I get, I mean, it's just a, a terrific experience for me. I'm very grateful to the disease and then to the, uh, you know, what's followed and to William, when I moved to Malibu, William has such an attractive program, you know, he does the right thing, he does the things that in my traditions are correct and makes his presence known and his program known and he befriended me and is, I'm always comfortable when I see him at meetings and I'm grateful for his, uh, for his giving me the cake tonight and thank you all very much. Tonight I have asked Mindy to read the 12 traditions for us. Hi, I'm Mindy, recovering alcoholic. Where are they? Are they here? Okay. The 12 traditions. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscious. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Number four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Number five, each group should have but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Number six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Number seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Number eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service boards may employ special workers. Number nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Number 10, 
Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name must never be drawn into public controversy. 11. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Number 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mindy. Okay, now let's give a warm welcome to our main speaker, Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. It's nice to be here. Um, I want to wish everybody a happy birthday. It was very impressive. And, and I like being in the room with people that have lots more time than me. It makes me feel secure. I don't want to have to know all the answers at 24 years, 7 months, and 5 days. I just don't want to know them all. So I always feel very secure when I'm on the path behind people with time. Um, and I want to thank Bara for asking me and Bill for the water and welcoming me and, and Tracy for asking me last uh, August, but they, clo they closed the uh, meeting. I think that was the water weekend, no water weekend. So I'm back. Um, I, I just want to thank Teresa for driving me and all my babies for being here and my friends. And um, Alcoholics Anonymous is, uh, is an unearned gift. I like the way you express that. It's um, we are really uh, sitting in the middle of grace tonight, and you know, anytime I'm with you, I feel like that. I get that feeling that um, by seconds and inches, we just the lucky ones to be here. I mean, it's truly just, you know, what John was talking about in his his first talk. It's just, you know, a f fraction of a hair here or a moment there. Um, this room wouldn't have as many people in it. Um, so I really, I really um, know that it's a blessing to be here, and I know the newcomers are probably going uh, right now, but that's okay. And I just want to let you know that you're, you know, you don't people that usually don't scratch or it doesn't itch, so you're probably um, belong here. So give it a little time and try not to drink and use in between meetings, and uh, you know, ask for a little help from somebody called a sponsor because um, maybe if you. We're listening to John's talk. He talked a little bit about his head, and it talks all about in the, in the big book about alcoholism, how it centers in the mind. Um, so physically, I've been sober a long time. I haven't taken anything, and but mentally, they're still up there. And um, you know, John has his trenches, and I've got I've got my bus, um, and they. They uh, they all have uh, they're all very entertaining, but you know sometimes they come up and sit with me in the front of the bus and we have to discuss life and but I usually send them to the back and and don't feed them and don't give them any clothing so they freeze to death and leave me alone and me and God sit in the front of the bus and drive every day but they're there they're there they're there and they all have names and they all have costumes and and uh, sometimes they're they think that they they can fool me like they're on my side and sometimes they're not and then when I get them all figured out they switch places on the bus and change clothes and they just get all confusing so if you're alcoholic don't listen to your head lock it in you know if you're new lock it in your trunk for about a, a year <laughs> and if you don't have a trunk borrow one and put it in there when I was uh, newly sober I had to be a food waitress and uh, because they wouldn't let me bartend anymore and so I, I would literally, my sponsor made me take my mind out of my head and put it in the trunk of my car and lock it in there before I went into my job. So I worked at this hotel and every morning the guard out there would watch me go around to the trunk of my car, open it up, go like this, this thing in, <laughs> lock the trunk, and go in, punch in, go to work. And then at the end of my shift, I'd come out, I'd unlock my trunk, I'd pick it up, put it back in, and then we'd all drive home, you know. But um, so I, I have a very loud head, so I have to have a sponsor louder than my head. So I hope that if you're new, you get a sponsor louder than your head, and you just don't listen to it. And, you know, make your feet your friends. So your feet won't betray you. They will get you to a meeting. They will walk you by the liquor store. They will, you know, walk you by that house that you know is trouble or that place where you're going to go. So make your feet your friend and listen to your feet and don't listen to your head. Take care of your feet. 
manicure them, rub them, pedicure them, take good care. I have very happy feet all of my life now. So um, I drank a lot. I used a lot. I was a product of the 60s. I had a lot of fun. Um, my first drink was 7 and 7, so I thank your company for that. Um, <laughs> and Schlitz beer. And it was in the middle of uh, the Midwest. I'm originally from Iowa. It's a yellow state on the map, if you don't know where it is. Um, <laughs> kind of nothing. And, but there were the boys from Iowa City, and there was the bourbon, and there was uh, that smell of bourbon through the English leather when you dance close with those boys from Iowa City to the Righteous Brothers with those V-neck sweaters. And, oh, I couldn't wait to get out in their car to have a taste of that bourbon. And... Um, I had good grades. I was a good little Catholic girl. I wanted to be a nun at one time. I had hopes and aspirations. I was artistic. I played a lot of instruments. I was one of four children. Nobody's alcoholic but me. And I was just confusing to a lot of people. You know, you al think that, you know, <laughs> we look at you and you give us those looks, even in sobriety, like, you know. <laughs> those looks, and I used to get those looks a lot from members of my family before I ever even took a drink. I was just very busy all the time, and, you know, now I know it's confusion. We really just confuse the hell out of people. You know, we really do, and, but I, I was so glad to go off to college, and I was so glad to, to break free that I went a whole 19 miles away to the university, and, <laughs> And I was drinking and, and having a great time, and I wasn't really going to classes. And pretty soon, the, you know, the 60s were upon us, and it wasn't just say no, it was just say thanks. We had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I started my quest for truth. There was a lot of that out there to help you uh, open your mind to find truth, except it would always melt before I could write it down. So, you know, I'd, I found it a lot of times. I just could never refine it. And, and I, there were a lot of organizations around that were protesting and, and um, you know, doing a lot of subversive type things. And so I started to uh, gravitate towards them because they were having a lot more fun. And, you know, pretty soon I was waking my parents up in the middle of the night to have discussions with them and <laughs> driving home to tell them I changed my name from Sharon to Cher, S-H-A-R-E. And, you know, my father would look at what I had drug home I was sharing with and go back to bed, and my mother would just, you know, oh, sharing. You know, she just would get up and go to bed, and we'd be sitting there like, what's, you know, God, we're just trying to have a nice talk with them. What's their problem? And, and I had a lot of fun, and I felt like a free spirit, and, you know, but my heart had gotten broken by this, this guy I was going to marry, and so I'm starting to drink. I drank medicinally over that. I remember drinking medicinally over those feelings of brokenheartedness, and but, uh, you know, I didn't cry, and I moved on, and, and I ended up um, going to uh, be-ins, love-ins, you know, everything that there was, looking for truth and looking, looking for a way. I was starting to get pretty lost. Um, my dad came down to see if I was okay uh, with the family priest after I had had a suicide attempt because somebody was sleeping on my albums one morning, and um, I just went and cut my wrist. That was my answer. Hit off the hash pipe or two and go cut my wrist. And so the priest and I got drunk, and my father was like aghast, and I ended up at the student union that night, um, you know, with the SDS guys and, and Father Kunch and me, and we were having a rowdy discussion, and we were smashed, and, you know, I don't know what happened to that priest, but, you know, I, I can tell you one thing that my dad was just appalled at what was going on. He had no idea, and he tried to talk to me, and he tried to help me, and I'd just point my finger at him and tell him all about the hypocrisy of his generation. And, and I, then I went to confession to try to really get right, and I had a fight with a priest in there, and I shook my fist at the church, and that was it. Um, goodbye, God. I don't need you. And I started to get a little bit more cold and a little bit more shut off from myself because alcoholism allowed me to shut off from myself. Alcoholism allowed me to just get kind of quiet inside. Alcoholism allowed me to have courage. It allowed me to walk over you, to walk, you know, how, whatever I had to do. Alcohol allowed me, it gave me that. My alcoholism was just ripe and ready. When I was 19, 20 years old, I could have come to this program. But 
I ended up taking geographics because they worked for a little while. I went to New York, and from New York I came back to the University of Iowa. I couldn't paint anymore. I had lost my art talent. It had run out my sleeve at some bar somewhere with some behavior somewhere. Who knows? Who knows if that bartender would have said, Sharon, if you act like this and, and you know, drink like that and do what you're going to do, you're not going to paint another picture for 28, 30 years. You know, I said, who cares? Pour it. You know, I was into the moment in my life. I had Be Here Now in my backpack, Love the One You're With was my song. <laughs> and if anybody wanted me to sign my worldly possessions, get committed or do anything for eternity, I said, I live a day at a time, see you guys. And that's the way I liked it. And I ended up in Colorado, and, and uh, I left a big piece of my dignity there. Near Aspen, I met Bob Dylan, I came to California, and uh, I, I think it was Bob Dylan, and, you know, I just uh, ended up at a commune, and it was. But I ended up at a commune, and they asked me to leave because I was depressing them, I guess, but I, and I came back to Colorado with my dog, and the town didn't want me there anymore, and so I ended up with my mother and father. I'm 21 years old, I've got my... All I had was a dog to show for the last couple of years I had been around, and, and then she got hit by a car, or a truck actually, and she, it was January, and it was depressing, and I had this gallbladder that didn't work, and I had pancreatitis, and nobody knew it. I went to the church for a few weekends, I went to, you know, I went to a um, family doctor, and he gave me Valium therapy for a while, and people were sending me books like, I'm okay, you're okay, and my sisters were worried about me, and my brother would try to talk to me, and... My dad and I couldn't. My dad and I could not sit at the same table at the same time and break bread. My father and I could not ride in the car at the same time. We could not walk down the hallway at the same time. God forbid our shoulders would rub and God forbid that we'd have to have an exchange because it was so much pain between me and dad. Dad was my hero. Dad was my man. Dad was my mainstay. Dad, you know, and Yep, I fought him all the way. Everything he ever tried to do for me, I fought him all the way because my alcoholism was so much louder than the love for my father. Um, and it was just, I was giving away pieces of who I was as I went along the road. You know, I don't, I don't know any other disease where you just kind of gladly give a piece of yourself up, but I was giving pieces of myself up for alcohol. And when it ended up at an organic farm in northern Wisconsin, I had my gallbladder removed, I was organic with these people, organic pot, organic wine, organic <laughs> sheep, organic hootenanny music. Everything was so organic. It was so boring. And I get drunk and they just all look at me like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you just smoke these? Why do you have to act that way? Because every time I would drink, the mouth would slip to the side, the boots would come on, you know, the stones were on, the radio was cranked up, whatever. I was just, ugh. we didn't have a TV. It was just too organic. But I got really, really sick, and they took me to the, to the hospital, and they took out my gallbladder, and the doctor said, I, you know, I looked like an old lady. Do I abuse drugs or alcohol? My insides were not well, and I said, I'm organic, and that was as honest as I could be, as honest as I could be. Somebody finally spotted truth in my life for a moment, and as honest as I could be was to look at him and say, I'm organic, and after a very cold winter and a lot of strife in that household because I was drinking cheap wine, and they were healthy and organic, um, I ended up, they all went and did primal therapy and I kicked them all out. And um, so I was drunk with the sheep and my wine, growing my half acre of marijuana with my friend Clarence the farmer who would bring the hard stuff at night on his tractor. And he was on a tractor because his license had been pulled for too many DWIs. And, <laughs> but he'd bring the hard stuff and we would sing and sometimes he wouldn't put in his teeth and I didn't care, he was my buddy and I brought the hard stuff. And, and I'd go get drunk and, and scream at the sheep and do my primal therapy. And, and I ended up um, harvesting that pot and going to get out of town. And, and I went in to sell it into Menominee. And I forgot the pot and joined the carnival. And that's the truth. It was there. <laughs> so I became a carny. And I ran a shooting gallery. And uh, my mother, I called her from Arkansas. And you know now my, my mother is starting to cry when I call home. I mean, it's... You know, my sister's finding me on the way and giving me, like, this Chinese ring that'll protect me. And it's just like, I would just look at, like, what is wrong with you, you know? I, can't you just see I'm just footloose and fancy free? I'm writing my book. Leave me alone. And it just seemed like there was so much disappointment, I couldn't look at it. And I have to shut off from that. And alcohol allowed me to get numb from those feelings of love for my family and people who cared about me and gave me those looks of confusion. And, and I ended up in jail for 
it's a felony. It was sales and possession, and they didn't. It was just mine. It was mine. You know, it was enough, I guess, that they thought I was selling, but I wasn't. And so I went to the jail with uh, Kirby, the, the skunk man, and because um, he was there and uh, he was in the room, and the skunk, the dog, me, and Kirby all went to to jail. And um, it was Bogalusa, Louisiana, and the carnival left town, and and I kind of hit a bottom a little bit there. <laughs> And my dad tried to help me. He came down, flew down, hired a lawyer. I couldn't get out. So when I finally got out, I had to pay a big fine. And what happened was I ended up living in Nolens, And I loved it. And I danced on Bourbon Street, and I attended bar, and, and I found all the alcoholics. And we would crawl from one bar to the next or pass out. And people would take care of each other. And, you know, I'd come to between, you know, a car and a on a curb somewhere and I'd look at myself and there'd be blood on me and I'd make sure it wasn't my blood and then I'd just get up and go end up in the Bastille again, you know, and and I'd be trying to get to my apartment down on Bourbon Street because, God, it was such a mess and, you know, it's just those uh, roaches were everywhere because I had tried to cook some red beans and I'd pick up the lid and it was full of roaches and I'd have to go put it in the shower and run hot water and try to get everything out and down in the shower and I was hung over all the time and we had this crazy landlord that was wearing my dresses and it was um it was great <laughs> i just i just loved the insanity and all the characters and and i'm living above a biker bar with this guy and the skunk droppings everywhere and my parents came and it was like oh my god we had just the snake was loose that day and it was you know it wasn't what mom and dad wanted for daughter number two i'll tell you and this new this guy had given me a new black eye and um you know there was no way that when my first boyfriend, I tried to swung at him and he put me, me on the floor with, you know, arm behind my back because I was drunk and mad at him because he was cheating on me. I thought, no man's ever going to touch me like that again. And now I am living in a situation where I am justifying it because I, I kept moving the line in the sand. Every time I draw it, I'd move the line in the sand because he was all I had. He was all I had. I had my Jose, my Jose Cuervo Gold. But he was really all I had, and and my uh, father couldn't look at me, and my mother cried, and it was just one of those days I wanted to go home and start over with him, and I knew something was so deathly wrong with me. And one of your uh, birthday people said that they didn't think they'd live to be 30, and mine was 25, and I didn't care. I started drinking with abandon. Family was over. There was, and I have a great family. I I love my family, and um, it was over. And it didn't work for me that day when I sat in the mousetrap bar and knocked back my rock glasses full of gold. It didn't work for me that day. And 1975, I mean, I did a lot of crazy things in blackouts. This guy finally left. It's a long story. I followed him. He broke a window, pulled my, me through, spit in my face, and said, if he ever saw me again, he'd kill me. And then, you know, the policeman pulled up, so it died out. And that's when I let go of the relationship was when it got that clear to me because, um, I'm a loyal Leo. I just don't give up until I'm ready, you know. I just hang on your leg as you're walking out the door, you know. If we're not done, we're not done. And Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me how to loosen my grip, how to um, open my arms, how to be flexible. You know, it really has taught me how to do all those things that I have to do to live life comfortably because I am in the comfort zone much of the time in my life today. I am tired of you know, knocking on the right side and bruising myself of the, of the hallway and knocking on the left side of the hallway and bruising myself. I like my comfort in the middle. There's, life gives you too many monkey wrenches to have to go beat myself up, you know, and the road does get narrow. I like my comfort zone right here in the middle. So, I, you know, it's, it's sometimes I think we just find it in the beginning. When you're new, you don't know what the comfort zone is for a lot of years. And it's like as you bounce off one wall to the next wall, you kind of go through it. So pay attention as you're going through the comfort zone. It's somewhere in the middle. I used to think serenity was boredom. You know, that's what I used to think it was. I didn't know feelings. I didn't know anger from hunger. I mean, I just was so short-circuited when I came to you. In 1975, I was 170 some pounds. I was unemployable. I'd gotten fired from my job on Lower Decatur Street tending bar at a s stinky, smelly, you know that place. He's laughing up here, you know. My friend was shot and killed uh, two feet to my left. I was in a blackout, seconds and inches. Uh, came to California, saw the big book in Barney's Beanery. Um, few of you guys here, huh? <laughs> 
And I was uh, wearing a red dashiki, a Panama hat. Everything I owned was in a backpack, and I was on the move and on the run. I was on my way to Hawaii. I was on my way to Hawaii. I ended up in Palm Springs. I ended up in the hospital. I uh, ended up broken jaw in three places, broken nose, uh, drug around in the cement, thrown outside of a car in the middle of the desert, and I should have had a concussion. I should have just bled. And I heard a voice. The voice said, get up. I want to live. And that was not my voice. And I can tell you that that was, um, that, was, that was a power greater than me because I was ready to go. I was 25 and ready to go. And I just really wanted to be known, you know, by my parents as daughter number two who was so talented and we just didn't know what happened to her. You know, I just really didn't want to bring them any more pain. Um, and I lay in that hospital for two weeks, and uh, they, they caught these guys. It was a big court case, and it was, uh, I was a victim of violent crime, and so they were treating me pretty, pretty um, you know, special and trying to take care of me and find out what my needs were. And, and my only need was to get out of there. I mean, I just wanted to get out of there. And when I ended up living above a, a liquor store in West L.A. because somebody in Barney's had heard what had happened to me, and he said I could come stay there. And so he would go to work buy me red wine from the duck pond downstairs. I would unscrew the top and stick a straw in and put a straw through the wires on the mouth where the tooth had been, and I would suck on red wine. And that was on a liquid diet, and that just seemed perfectly fine to me. And there was no more courage or excitement or life in alcohol. You know, the spirit that alcohol used to give me was no longer there. Um, you know, it had, been, it had been fading for a lot of years, but I could always manage to kind of get it back. Alcohol was, it was I, I mean, I loved it from the tip of my head to the tip of my toes. It filled me up. It made me whole. It allowed me just to be omnipotent. You know, it just gave me so much, and I think that I was always uh, spiritually searching. I am a searcher. I probably always will be a spiritual searcher, and there's nothing wrong with that in sobriety. Uh, my basis is here. My steps are here. From that point, you can keep growing spiritually. You can keep getting more. I'm a more type of alcoholic. I want more. I always want more. And I'm, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I get more when I work more, when I do more of the work. I, um, I've never been disappointed here. I'm so glad you don't. Ten years, that's it. Don't get any more, you know. <laughs> no, it just keeps getting better and better. And then watching Charles with 45 years and how his life seems to be coming together again, you know, I just think it's so terrific. And because life is full of hallways. It's full of hallways. But at the end of that hallway, when you finally get through it and you open that door, the view is just so much more beautiful than the one you lived in before you went in the hallway. And I'm continually surprised by by the growth of the spirit of, of the light here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, um, it is a spiritual program. It's not a religious program. It is a spiritual program. It's about your heart. It's about your, your spirit. It is about being part of the force for good. And uh, when I sit in these meetings next to you every single night, I feel that. I feel I'm a link in the chain. And I want to keep my link strong because the person right next to me might need me someday. I don't want to break it with me. Um, the girl who got me to Alcoholics Anonymous was the girl with the big book, and I called her one morning because my mother had said that she couldn't give me any more money and I should try the Salvation Army. And um, I, uh, I called up Chris, and she recognized the disease because she was an alcoholic. She wasn't sober that day, but the blessing was that she was there and she recognized the disease, and that was my window of opportunity. And I didn't even know my window of an ultimate grace, as we've all had them, to get, get us here. And, uh, you know, if Mom would have said, you know, Sharon, I'm just going to send you a little money out of the grocery money, and that's it. Please don't call home anymore. You would have another speaker. But she said, no, you should try the Salvation Army. And that's when I called Chris. And Chris said, I know Suzanne who can help you. Chris died at 31 of this disease. She didn't make it. She had seven tries in and out. And the eighth try, she didn't have. So I don't know how many tries we have. You know, nobody gives us a uh, ticket when you walk in the door. If you're here, hang on to the seat. You know, have a lot of come on midnight days if you have to. Talk to somebody sitting next to you, but you don't have to go out anymore. You do not have to prove anything anymore. It takes a lot more guts to stay sober than it does to go out and drink. A lot more. Um, I'm so proud of us. I'm so proud of the millions of us now that are here. Um, 
because, uh, you know, not everybody gets a chance to know what it's like to hear Chapter 5 or have some of that AA coffee, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's really, I have no problems. Norm used to say God gives the big loads to the big horses and the little loads to the guys named Norm, you know. No matter what I go through my life now, I've already won the lotto. I beat the odds by being here. So I, I shoulder my little loads, hopefully as gracefully as possible with my program. And, and I've had a lot. There's been a lot in my life. Um, you know, when I first got sober, I, I had no idea I wanted to be here. I had no idea I was an alcoholic. I had no idea I could stay sober. They just said, don't drink and use, and we'll pick you up tomorrow night. And they moved me out of that liquor store, and, and my sobriety started by sleeping on various women's floors in their first year of sobriety. And they were all working on the steps, and I didn't know what that was. I had, my mother had sent me a little blender so I could eat because I was wired shut the first three months I was here. So I had to learn to listen, so it was really a blessing. Um, it was a blessing that, that I didn't say anything for the first three months I was here. And then I went off to work, and I got the sponsor louder than my head, and we started the steps. And Janet was just so, she was so in touch with my anger. I didn't know I was angry. I would, I'd be the type of person, you'd say something to me at the meeting, it would make me a little bit upset, and I didn't know, but I would go home, I'd be in bed, and maybe a week later, I would wake up and have my comeback to what I should have said to you, you know. And I was just not living in the present at all. I didn't know how to do that. And, you know, slowly the wires of the computer have been put back together the right way so that they sparked when you put them back together. And one day I woke up, and it was seven years. I was seven years sober when I really became whole. I tip of my head to the tip of my toes, whole. It took that long for me. And... By that time, I'd been through the steps a couple of times. And, you know, my first third step was, you know, on my knees at her house because she wanted me to. And I just wanted to please her, you know, because uh, you want to please your sponsor. It's a little easier than having to be mad at you all the time. And, you know, she was powerful in my life, and she intimidated me, and it was good. And so, you know, after praying that and getting on her knees, and she hugged me, and, and she wouldn't let go, and it, then it started to feel good, and I thought I must be gay because it was feeling good, and it's like, <laughs> you know, I was so confused as to what was going on with me, and so, you know, I met another newcomer. He had six more months than me. He just celebrated 25 years, and uh, at two years of sobriety, we got married, and you know, one night she walked by me, she said, you better get your own sponsor, you're going to get drunk, because I was standing next to him, and we were, you know, sharing with the newcomers all of our experience with about nine, ten months of sobriety, <laughs> and she said, uh, you know, you better get your own sponsor, you're going to get drunk, and I thought, you know, don't embarrass me in front of these newcomers here, I'm sharing my program, you know. <laughs> And she said, well, you better get your own. And I said, good, it's Beacon's moving then. What do you think about that? And it was because Beacon's truck was parked across the street. So I, she said, good, as long as it's not you, you know. And I wanted to explain myself to her, but she didn't really care. She kind of stood there and patronized me as the other newcomers really got it, though, because, you know, Beacon's is a truck that moves things. And I went all over this country. I went a lot of places. I hitchhiked all over. I was just taken care of. I was like wrapped in those beacons quilts, you know, when you move furniture, I, God wrapped me in those quilts, and, and you know, I'm kind of like an old bureau, where there was a little knob off here, and a scratch there, and a saddle crooked, but we got to AA, you know, we got there, and the newcomers really are getting it, you know, and she's just like, as long as it's not you, and she walked on by, and so I prayed to beacons for a long time, just to make her mad, and, um, <laughs> But it started for me again. It started for me. And every time now when I see a Beacon's truck, I take a deep breath. I feel better. I know I'm going to be okay. So, and people will call me from all over the country. I saw a Beacon's truck was thinking about you. How are you? You know? <laughs> so, and it seems like I see one right when I need one all the time. And, you know, I have a 15-year-old now. And so sometimes we have discussions. And um, he always looks at me and goes, how do you know, Mom? It's like, because I'm the master of manipulation. Don't ever try to run anything by me. And... Um, <laughs> How do you know I'm lying? Because I'm the master, you know. <laughs> he hates it. He hates it. And he loves to see, Mom, there's a beacon truck. Turn it over, you know. And <laughs> so, but what happened was, you know, I wasn't so afraid of God anymore. And I started with that. And, and it turned into, you know, I sponsored a nun. I had to go back to this church and wait for her and go have dinner with her. And there I was sitting in the Catholic church, and I wasn't being zapped by, uh, you know, lightning bolts. So I guess it was okay. And, and, uh, you know, it was just an, it's an, it was amazing healing for me and the transition and being, um, being a mom and being married and, and uh, making my amends to 
the carnival because they had a carnival at that church every year and I had to sit there and give out tickets to the kids and I would buy all these tickets for the kids so I could make my amends. I did that for nine carnivals and I felt like good. My son's done with this school now I can move on from that amends. So you know I had a lot of dogs and animals that were killed and my turtle crawled through the cocaine and you know got a little stiff but he had a little smile and um, <laughs> I came to, and one was alive, and one was smiling and stiff, and, um, you know, and just, I felt really bad about that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things that happen with the animals, and, and so I, you know, I've been able to make my amends there, too, and, and it's just, there's so many different ways, and, you know, I, I got married, and I was married a long time, and then he wanted somebody else, and, you know, somebody else was, she wasn't, a, she was new, and, you know, she was, part of the group and I didn't think she was as cute as me and you know I just thought what is this all about you know eight year marriage and I have this baby and oh my god you know my jobs had gotten better life had gotten better and he just didn't want me anymore and I couldn't lay down and hang on his leg as he walked out the door because I had 10 years of sobriety and I had 10 years of some worth by working these steps and having a god and I had to let him go you know and and uh, they had a baby and they got married and and it's, <sighs> Nobody got custody of the meetings, and it was just real hard. And my sponsor of 21 years had 21 days when she got off an airplane, and I had to go get Clancy, and it was just so humiliating. It was the hardest year of my life. I turned myself in again and sit in that hallway and know my turn will come if I just hang in there. And, and uh, you know, one year, one month, 18 days later, I did get my turn. The door opened, and I've never looked back. I've never looked back. Um, and, uh, you know... That, that second wife is in the room tonight, and she's a good, good friend of mine. And, um, you know, they've been divorced a few years, so we're better friends now. So. <laughs> he married an Al-Anon, and he seems to be happy with that. So, But, um, you know, Jill and I share the children. We have a good time, and we do things together. And I'm just so glad she's in my life because, you know, we, we're kind of the same kind of people. He picked the same kind of people. And... We get along better with our relationship than I think we ever did with him, each one of us. So, and I, you know, my, my, uh, my dad and I had a long ways to go. I just want to tell you about that. I, it's just so important in my life. Amends have been so important. I got to make amends to New Orleans. From out of that came a pardon from the state of New Orleans. I'm no longer a convicted felon anymore. Um, some wonderful things have happened to me. And, and I, I went home every year to Iowa to make my amends. And every year I would, you know, they would get a little bit better with my dad. And then my sponsor, Jenny, said, it's five years of sobriety. Why don't you pay him back the money you owe him? And it was like, how do you know about that? And because she's the master, you know. And, and so I started sending him a check every month because he accepted my terms. And he had actually worked out a calculator tape because he had read the big book and, you know, put it on page 79 where it says most alcoholics owe money. And circled it and read at the bottom and so when I called him he was ready for me um, <laughs> and I sent him a check every month and my sponsor insisted that I send him a note with that to put it in a card or to send a note with a check not just the check but about my life and I fought her on that but I did it anyway and I did that for four years and my father called me between Christmas and New Year's himself dialed the phone and said Merry Christmas Sharon I don't want your money anymore your debt is free and clear, and that would have been enough for me. But my loving sponsor had made me write those notes and had made me write those letters that it really healed. It really healed at that moment that he said, don't stop sending me your notes. And my dad and I got to walk into a guilt-free, beautiful relationship that I never thought was possible, ever. And, um, you know, he was killed last April 19th. I'm coming up on, the, on that, that, that year. And, um, but, you know, I was clean with my dad. That was a lot of years of just listening and being his friend and spending time with him so that, you know, I got to write him one more note and put my 23-year chip in that because I would not have had a relationship without that. Without amends and Alcoholics Anonymous, I would not have been able to be Daddy's little girl again. And the innocence came back in my life. And I got square with men and I got square with myself. And there were just so many more healings that you just have no idea. And I have so many more to do, I'll tell you that. But I'm ready. I am, I am just ready. You know, if you are bored with your sobriety, you are boring. Let's get going. There's so much to do here. There is so much to do here. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a terrific relationship with a man, and our, our, our passion is based on gratitude. Um, I have a great 15-year-old kid who looks at me and says, you wasted so much time drinking, didn't you, Mom? 
It's like, yeah, I'm so glad he's got it. And, um, you know, all his friends like to come over because they think I'm the cool mom, you know, because uh, we, we have a house full of love and a house full of spirit and a house full of God. And, you know, and I have a dog and three cats today because um, they found their way to my house. And, you know, and, and my prayer is real simple. I try to do my meditation in the morning walk with my dog. And, and you know, she just looks at me, and I, it's, it's, it's my prayer, and I'll leave it with you. It's my dog just looks at me, and... and with awe and love and unconditional just care for me and protection for me. And, and it's, it's just what my friend Mary Regan used to say, you know, God, just please help me to become half the person my dog thinks that I am. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Ain't AA grand. Okay. This has been another typical Saturday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Cool. Uh, now we will have announcements from our secretary, Bara. Hey. Um. Oh. May we have another? You were awesome. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the newcomers. Would you please stand up so that we can get to know you? Chris, Monica, Lauren, Tony, Eric, Steve, Mark, Ray, Vicki, up, 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 Wendy, Kevin, Brian, Richard, Natalie, Brian, Annie, Paul, Jim, Kathy, Karen, Rob, Andy, and Randy. Yay! You are the lifeblood of AA, and I pray that you heard something tonight that will keep you sober. If you didn't hear it tonight, you'll never hear it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, out of towners, could you please stand up? Eva from New York, Michelle from New York, Elizabeth from New York, Ted from New York, Shahad, New York, Brian from Rye, New York, Craig Mammoth Lakes, Richard San Antonio, Wendy Houston, Jim Houston, Kathy Houston, Karen from Omaha, Francine and Lo Francine from Mill Valley, and Lori from Minnesota. Welcome to Malibu. And uh, let us congratulate the birthday people. Yes. <laughs> there was probably 300 years of accumulative sobriety on the stage tonight. Please keep coming back. And now we have our literature person, Dan. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm not Hi, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. We make tapes and sell them, and our tape person is Chris. Hi, I'm Chris, your alcoholic tape person. Hi, Chris. And if you ever hear a voice that sounds like a New York gangster, you need to buy a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, clean up around your area. Help, please help stack the chairs. Don't drag them on the floor. Our cleanup person is Dave. Thanks, Dave. 
Our chair wrangler is Matt. Hi, Matt. Newcomer list. We have Michael and Tracy. Michael will speak. <laughs> Tracy will speak. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is another meeting if you feel you need one this evening. There is a candlelight meeting at Michael Landon, and that's where Malibu uh, Canyon meets PCH. And that's at 10.30, I believe. 10.30 tonight. Uh, parking lot here closes at 10 o'clock, so please get your car out if you wish to have one by 10 o'clock, and thank the speakers before that. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Greg for his report and going to the meetings tonight, and uh, for Richard and Julie for their avocados. <laughs> And a special thanks to Bill, my co-secretary, and thank you all for letting me be of service. Thank you, Bara. Okay. I'd like to thank, you've already thanked everybody, huh? Uh, Robert for reading Chapter 5, Mindy for the 12 Traditions. Um, court cards will be signed by myself or Co-Secretary Bill at the podium after the meeting. And after a moment of silent meditation for the alcoholic who still suffers, would Joanne lead us in the Lord's Prayer? 